thank you for joining this incredible live stream event. We will be starting in five minutes. In the meantime, while you wait, please check out our store table located in the foyer of Revived Church or in our online store at olivetreeviews.org. Welcome to Understanding the Times. So glad you could join us tonight. Yeah. 
My name is Jan Mark Hill, and we're in a lovely uh, revived church here in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And they make all of this event possible. We've had, this is our second anniversary. We started in August of 2021. And I think we've had a dozen, 15 meetings just like this. I hope you gleaned from them. Pastor Mark Henry makes it all pass possible. And this wonderful church. Well, I just want to welcome all of you in Jesus' name tonight. In fact, what I want you to do is turn to someone and say, happy anniversary. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All of you online who are joining us, go ahead and put it in the comment section. Happy anniversary, Jan. This is our anniversary together. That's right. So we're thankful for that. <laughs> well, Jan, every time we have one of these, it always shocks me because God's given us grace over the last 60 days to be able to gather again and to look to the Lord Jesus and try and sort out these days and try and encourage one another. And I specifically want to welcome all of you who are joining us online from around the world uh, we want you to know you're part of the family. We wish you were here. Jan and I prayed for you several times throughout the day because we know many of you feel lonely, separated, uh, and you wish you could be here in person. Just know that your love prayed over and, and the Lord is with you. Um, I also want to encourage you if you're online and you're not having a watch party, next time plan for a watch party. October 5th is going to be our next gathering, and uh, I want to encourage you to avail yourself to that. Tonight, uh, as we're talking about a number of things, you might have heard Jan talk about, we're going to have an amazing night, talking about chips, chips in the head, and all kinds of other things. <laughs> but she was amazing when she made that. I was, I, was just, I was blown away. But the one thing I want you to walk away with tonight are the words of Jesus from the upper, uh, not the upper room discourse, but from the Olivet discourse, his long sermon on eschatology. He starts it with the disciples asking a question, what is the sign of your coming? And, and they ask a couple of other questions. And before he answers any of that, he says these words in verse 4. He says, see to it that no one misleads you. I, that's really important because the last days are going to be filled with deception. In fact, he uses that same Greek word four times in the text. And Jan's heart for you, my heart for you, Jeff's heart for you is that you would not be misled in these last days. So we're, let's just start with prayer. Can we do that and just ask the Lord to bless our time together? Father, again, we're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we're thankful for those words he gave the disciples then. And the principle, the, the, the reality, the truth remains true for us today. God, I pray that tonight as we open the scriptures, as we talk about the truth that sets us free in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we understand some of the things that are happening around us, I pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds. Uh, so that we would not be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion that's in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. God, keep us uh, in the hollow of your hand. Show yourself strong in our behalf, we pray mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just keep in mind, after our keynote address tonight, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion and a Q&A, and there's going to be a phone number up there on the screen. And if you're joining us from anywhere in the world tonight, you can text in your your questions, and uh, we'll take a number of those and, uh, and try and answer them. Well, we have had the privilege of working with Jeff Kinley for a number of years, and I've had him on air. We had him here a year ago, right here on the platform with uh, Mark Hitchcock a year ago. He's written 40 books. He is, is um, pro uh, prolific in media. Uh, I think he has three or four media programs, and some of you have seen him on his channel on the various other presentations that he has, Jeff Kinley Live, um, Pro Prophecy Pros with Todd Hampson. So I'm just so privileged I, to have him here live and in person this evening. He's going to open with whatever God has put on his heart. It's going to be from the book of Revelation. We'll say more about some of the products that he has later. Um, and then, as Mark said, we're going to have a short discussion up here in our Q&A. So you might want to get a question or two in your mind as well. So I think without any further hesitation, we're going to move quickly tonight because we have a lot to do in a short time. And uh, Jeff, come on out, please, would you? Such a privilege to have you. <laughs> Jeff Kinley. Well, good evening, church. It is great to see all of you uh, who have come here tonight. I know that many of you have uh, driven long distances to be here, and so that makes me feel good. You know, that, you, that this was something important to you, and it tells me that you love Jesus, 
and you want to know more about him. I'd like to say thank you so much to uh, Pastor Mark Henry and to Jan uh, for inviting me to be here in this uh, great gathering of believers tonight. Now, as Jan mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about Revelation. We'll get there here in, in just a little bit. Uh, real quickly, just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, what she had said about some of the ministries. And one of the things I'm most excited about right now is that I've been asked to um, essentially take over the teaching duties uh, for Dr. Ed Heinsohn's TV show, The King is Coming. And so this is something that now we've started to do, and we're taping many programs. And so you can uh, check that out, thekingiscoming.com. We'll run through these real quickly. Of course, Jeff Kinley Live is 30 minutes every week on Bible Prophecy. That's on his channel, uh, .com. You can check that out. And then the Prophecy Pros. This is a little podcast uh, that Harvest House uh, sponsored here about four years ago, I think, maybe. And uh, this thing has just exploded. Uh, it, we're well over a million uh, viewers right now, and uh, we've just reached the top 1% of all podcasts, secular and Christian, in the country. And so God is just doing amazing thing there, yeah. You know, and that just goes to show what kind of hunger there is uh, out there for Bible prophecy. Uh, then finally, you can catch my Vintage Truth podcast, my teaching uh, podcast on a variety of biblical uh, subjects on uh, Jack Hibbs' Real Life Network, all right? So you can check that out. And then jeffkinley.com is my website. Okay, so we're going to talk about tonight the primacy of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. And how is Jesus really the central figure of the book of Revelation? Not long ago, I was walking through my, um, my dining room and I heard a voice. Now, lest you go to this place where you think Jeff Kinley's lost his marbles and he's hearing voices here, uh, it came from a little counter where we have this little device called Alexa, all right? I know she's listening to everything, okay? I get that part, right? So we, we watch what we say uh, around the house. But Alexa said this. She said, and I quote, the millennial kingdom has arrived. <laughs> and I turned and I said, Alexa, what did you just say? She said, the millennial kingdom has arrived. And I thought, I thought, no, wait a minute. Number one, I didn't know Alexa was in the Bible prophecy. And number two, I didn't know she was an amillennialist. <laughs> she thinks we're in the kingdom right now, okay, you know. And then it dawned on me, I had ordered a book by John Walford called The Millennial Kingdom. <laughs> and sure enough, folks, The Millennial Kingdom had arrived. <laughs> I don't know what to say. But, uh, but, but all that to say is we're not there yet, okay? Uh, it's coming, but we're not quite uh, there yet. But what we are seeing is a ramping up, what I call a ramping up to revelation uh, in a lot of different areas here. Uh, we see it with globalism converging all across the world. There are calls for a one world government, and uh, we'll maybe touch on that tonight. Uh, we're seeing it with the uh, digital economy uh, emerging, uh, this whole idea of the central digital bank currency, the Fed now, all these things that are being rolled out right now uh, digitally. Uh, we see it with apostasy infiltrating the church. And this is where the, the, the foxes are in the hen house right now uh, in America. Uh, we see it with the spirit of Antichrist rising. And John warned us in the first century, the spirit of Antichrist was alive in his day, even much more so in our day as we get ready for Antichrist, the world does. We see Israel's enemies threatening. Uh, we see this whole thing with Russia moving south. Uh, we see Israel's enemies around her uh, threatening her. Uh, and then finally, we see it with moral deception spreading the deception and the depravity. And all of these things put together tell us this one thing, that we are ramping up to Revelation. The world is taking the exit ramp leading to the book of Revelation. Now, again, we're not there yet, uh, but as Mark said during the Olivet Discourse, Jesus told us what would happen, and there'll be great deception uh, leading up to that. But just for a moment, let's take a, a, a moment and just rewind for a second. Let's go back and let's look to how God has not only communicated how the future is going to be, but how he's been doing this all along for us. In fact, back in the book of Genesis, we see God uh, telling us that this supernatural communication really began all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And in Genesis 1-1, God reveals something about himself. The very first words of the Bible were God telling us something about himself. 
He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we call the Bible the written revelation of God. And that revelation begins in Genesis uh, 1.1. Now, this verse is packed with a lot of theology, and we don't have time to go through the whole thing. But those 10 words reveal a lot about who God is. It tells us that he's eternal, that it, logically he predates his creation. Of course, to create it, he had to be. It tells us that he's supernaturally powerful or omnipotent. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, it tells us that he is divinely powerful, uh, his attributes. It tells us that he is creative, a master architect and creator and builder. And uh, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the handiwork of God. Uh, it tells us that he is awe-inspiring. I love what God says to Job in Job uh, 38. He says, Job, remind me, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You see, God made the world despite what others would say. And it also tells us that he's a, a God of great detail, order, and precision. Now, all of that, you and I can know about God. The problem is you and I live in an age where we don't look up anymore. We're looking down at our phones. We're not looking up. There's there's city lights that block out the heavens. And so unless you're out in the country somewhere, you're not going to really be able to see the heavens and appreciate this awe-inspiring God because we're so focused on our own lives. Now, all that comes from one single verse of the Bible. But wait, there's more. Back in the 19th century, there was an English philosopher named Herbert Spencer. There's uh, Dr. Spencer there. He was a Darwinian disciple, and he recognized five principles, he said, by which we can understand everything in the universe— Those five principles were time, force, energy, space, and matter. Now, amazingly, unbeknownst to Spencer and the fact that his barber had taken a very long holiday, apparently, (laughs) unbeknownst to Spencer, the Bible had already discovered those things. In fact, in the first 10 words of Scripture, you have those same five principles that are revealed to us. They are in the beginning, that's time. Uh, God, that's force, created, that's energy, the heavens, that's space, and earth, that's matter. And so God, isn't that great? Give God a hand, yeah. Yeah. The very first words of your Bible tell you all about science and about physics and about astronomy because God had already made it all. God explains in these first verses what scientists still struggle to articulate. So I like to say that our universe began with a big God, not a big bang, because God is the one who divinely spoke these things into existence. Now that, in Genesis 1-1, is what we call revelation. And over the centuries, what God did was he progressively continued to give us his revelation. I like to think of it like the dimming of the lights, so that God began to turn the lights up so that we could see more and more about him. And to the Jewish people and through the Jewish people came the scriptures. That's how we have the scriptures that we have today in our Bible. And it's another reason why Satan hates the Jewish people and hates Israel so much because they gave the world the scriptures. But as God began to continue his revelation, we get to the New Testament and the capstone of that revelation is the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation of Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God to us. And Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that he is the exact radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. And so God began, uh, continued to inspire throughout the New Testament, and then we come, here we are, to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, God gives his final written word to the church and ultimately to mankind. It's the last thing he will ever say in print. And I don't know if you know this or not, But last words are lasting words. When Jesus spoke those words on the Mount of Olives, those were some of the last words he gave to his disciples concerning the apocalypse. And so as we think about last words, we think that God had one final crowning conclusion, one chapter to the right, one grand finale. The question is, what would he say? God, how are you going to end your book, your magnus opus, your masterpiece, of revelation to the world. Will you tell us, love one another? And had God had a whole book on just loving each other, we would have thought, wow, what what an appropriate ending to the Bible. Would he tell us to remember the things that he's told us in the previous 65 books? We would have said, well, we certainly need that. We tend to forget, right? Maybe he would have said something like, just keep on keeping on, keep following me, that type of thing. He did none of those things. You know what he said? 
He gave us a book that was 95% Bible prophecy. Why? God did that because he wants you and I to have a heads up on the future. He wants us to know what's going to happen. But concurrently with God revealing the future, beyond just a pictorial verbal panorama about what's going to happen in the end end of the age, with with demons and antichrist and judgments and all these things that are going to take place, God did this. He reserved the last book of the Bible to reveal his self and his attributes to you and me. Why? Because he wants you above all things, even above, above knowing the future, he wants you and I to know him personally. And so Revelation is God's grand finale and it's his final way to tell us This is who I am. And just to sweeten the pot just a little bit, God says in Revelation 1, 3, and if you read this book, I'll bless you. You know, people ask, what is that blessing that you get from Revelation? If you you read it, if you hear it, and if you obey it, if you heed it. Well, part of that blessing is you get to know God in ways you never thought you could. And Revelation reveals who God is. Now, why did he need to do this? Well, because in just two short generations What happened was the church had had drifted from God. Uh, They had gone away from the Lord. In fact, the church no longer even recognized herself when she looked in the mirror. And God certainly didn't recognize her. And so he wrote this book partially to wake up the bride, to prepare her for the imminent return of his son at the rapture. And so God gives us this this vision. There's Herbert Spencer. He's all Google-eyed because he can't believe (laughs) that God knew things he didn't know, you know? So let's talk about this. If Revelation is a guide to knowing God, where are we headed tonight? Let me give you a quick overview. This is what's going to happen here. We're going to see who Jesus is, what he has done, uh, what he's going to do, John's vision of Christ, his response to Jesus, and then Jesus' response back to John. And through seeing these things, we begin to see Revelation as God's grand finale. So you know the scene. John has been exiled by the Roman emperor Domitian to the Isle of Patmos. It's a 10-mile by 6-mile rock out in the Aegean Sea. I call it the Alcatraz of the Aegean Sea. And so John is out there. He's in his 90s at this point. Uh, Church fathers tell us that John had been persecuted. He'd been boiled alive in oil. And while he was in the oil, he continued to preach the gospel. So here's a man who has endured, who has persevered. And God chooses John to give him the last ever revelation about who he is. So what does God want us to know about him? What does God want us to know? Before we get into the apocalypse, before it's revealed what the judgments are going to be about Antichrist, about the second coming, millennial kingdom, the eternal state, God chose as his top priority before any of those things to let you and I know who he is. And this is exactly what chapter one of Revelation does. It's not the intro to Revelation, it's the essence of Revelation. And all throughout the book, we see the attributes of God just rising up out of these waters, and identifying the book's 13 ways that God uh, tells us about who he is. Well, right here in this first chapter, there are also 13 different attributes of this great Jesus Christ. So here's my warning to you. We're about to get on a plane ride, and we're going to travel across this vast expanse called Revelation chapter 1. So buckle in, because we're about to have takeoff here, and hopefully I can land the plane on time. But this passage here in Revelation 1 is packed with dense theology. My challenge to you tonight is to go back through Revelation 1 slower than you're going to hear it tonight and to examine each of these attributes and how these things impact our lives so that we can understand that the key to knowing Revelation is knowing the Christ of Revelation. So let's move on. Let's get on to it here. What does he say? He begins in verse 1 saying that Jesus Christ is the reliable Christ. We already know from chapter 1, verse 1, that it's the revelation of or about Jesus Christ. Revelation is all about Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, this revelation is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. And why does he say that? Well, it's a, it's a phrase that he repeats later on uh, to the churches. But listen, everything in Revelation is predicated upon the credibility of Jesus Christ. If Jesus is not a truth teller, How can we trust the rest of Revelation? Because it's coming from him, right? And it's also to contrast what you're going to see in the rest of Revelation, which is the one who does not tell the truth, 
That would be the Antichrist. That would be the false prophet. That would be Satan. Uh, Jesus calls Satan the father of lies in John 8, 44. And so Christ is the only one that's going to tell the truth. In fact, he said that in John 14, 6. Remember that? I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. And you know, right now in our culture, let's be honest. We are not just swimming in a sea of lies. We are drowning in a sea of lies in our culture. And the only place we can go to get the absolute undiluted truth is this book right here. It's the only place we have. And so I encourage you to go there. It's the words of Jesus Christ. He's reliable. Secondly, he's also the risen Christ. Uh, He says here that he is the firstborn from the dead. And that word firstborn is the Greek word prototokos, which means preeminent one, first in line, heir to the throne. Uh, He is the one who has been resurrected unlike anyone else has ever been resurrected. He's the firstborn, and he is preeminent among all others. He goes on to say he's the ruler of the kings of the earth in verse 5. Later on in chapter 19, verse 16, we'll see where he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, if you want to do a great study sometime, go to Isaiah chapter 40 and study what God says. This is God actually speaking, what God says about the kings of the earth. And right now we're living in a time where the kings of the earth are trying to push a, a mandate of fear upon the populace. We have presidents, prime ministers, kings, queens, premiers, popes, you name it. They want to spread this narrative of fear. And the Bible says in Isaiah 40 that all God has to do is simply blow on them like dust on the scales and they scatter to the wind. All of the rulers of this world, my friend, are simply dust in the wind to Jesus Christ. He is the ruler over the rulers of the king of the world. That's one of the first things that John learns. Let's move on. It says he is also the redeeming Christ. And I love this in verse 5. It says, to him who loves us. You notice it does not say who loved us, but who loves us currently, present tense, right now. And this speaks of God's loyal, faithful love. You see, it's the equivalent of the Hebrew chesed, which means a loyal, faithful, unconditional love. It means he will never let go. It means he will always love us. It means he will never love us more than he does right now. It means we are covered. We are protected. We are in the beloved. We are adopted by him. And you know, sometimes in our lives, we just need to pull the car over and turn the engine off and just contemplate this thought. The God of this universe loves me. And it's not a cold truth. It's not some theological thing that's written in a book. It's reality and it's experiential. To him who loves us, how does he, how did he love us? Well, it says here in verse 5, he released us from our sins by his blood. Jesus Christ has broken the chains of the power of sin in our lives. Certainly the penalty of sin, because Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but he's also broken the power of sin. Sin no longer has reign or rule or authority or dominion over us. We now have the power, because of what Christ did for us and our identification with him, to overcome sin. That's power, my friend. And then the Bible tells us one day we'll be free from the presence of sin. That's all because he has redeemed us uh, from our sins by his blood. That's why we call it the precious blood of Christ, what Peter says there. Unshackled us. Uh, Verse 6, it says this. It says he's made us to be a kingdom, a priest to his God and Father. What does that mean? Well, from a Jewish standpoint, you no longer have to go through a priest for your sins to be forgiven, have access, as it were, to God. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16 tells us that we can now draw near with confidence to the throne of what? Anybody know? Grace. The throne of grace that we may receive mercy to help us in our time of need. Did you know that because of Jesus Christ, this revelation Christ, which we'll see more about in a minute, because of him, you and I, when we go to God, we will always, always, always receive grace and mercy. There'll never be condemnation. Uh, There'll never be hatred. Uh, There'll never be punishment. Might be discipline, but never punishment. Why? Because the Bible tells us that, that we have access to God through Jesus Christ. We are priests to God to come to him. And so John gets to this one point here, and he begins to reflect on this salvation, and it jumpstarts something in the heart of John. What does it do? Look at verse 6. 
It says, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In other words, it prompts worship. Every time you and I think about what Christ has done for us, the natural response is worship. In fact, in Revelation, there are some 14 doxologies or, or worship scenes in the book of Revelation. Why? Because periodically, as you study the attributes of God, you just got to pull over and say, I've got to worship this God. I've got to know who he is even more. All right, moving on here. Uh, he goes on to say that he's also the, uh, the returning Christ. Look at verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. Now, this is speaking about the second coming of Christ. This is the one where every eye will see him. Uh, the whole earth won't see Christ at the rapture. He'll come in the clouds. But at the second coming, he's coming to the earth. It's going to be visible. It's going to be a global event. It's going to be globally televised. And everyone will see him. But it says they will, they will have a sense of dread. They will mourn over him. A Zechariah 12, 10 says, why? Well, it's not the mourning like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, it's mourning like, uh-oh, he's back. He's back. That's the kind of mourning, the kind of dread that his enemies will have uh, in that day. He's a returning Christ. Verse 8 says he is an unrivaled Christ. He's unrivaled. Uh, he, he, can't, he has no equals. It says that, uh, it says right in the book, uh, excuse me, uh, in verse uh, 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega, the two uh, bookends of the Greek alphabet. It's saying that Jesus Christ is the sum total of all knowledge. You want to be smart? Know Jesus. You want to know what the world's all about? Know Jesus. If you want to know what life is all about, or even yourself, who you really are, don't ask the world, ask Jesus. Because he is the sum total of all knowledge. So I love uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2 says, In him uh, are, are found all the, the wisdom and knowledge of the ages here. And so he's, uh, he's unrivaled. And then he goes on to say this. He's also revealing. Because in verse 11, he tells John, Now, John, you write in a book what you see. Twelve times in the book of Revelation, John uh, claims to see certain things. He says, I want you to write in a book what you're going to see. And what John saw, he put into print for you and I. So this vision that he had, this supernatural vision, this HD 4K vision that John has, he wrote it down in a book. My friends, listen, this is one of the biggest myths of Christianity today. That Revelation is somehow this hidden book, this, this cryptic book. But listen, it's not. It was, it's called the book of Revelation, okay? To reveal, not to uncover, not to hide. So revelation is not a code to be deciphered, it's a truth to be believed. And we can trust its plain sense when God gives it to us. And so he gives us this, this, this revelation to John, John, write it down. Now, we're in the air, we're going to take a little bank turn here, because that's what the scripture does. And now John pivots, and he says, now I'm going to reveal uh, to you what Jesus revealed to me about who he is. John's getting deeper and deeper into the vision here. And he's building this, this great foundation for the rest of the book of Revelation. And now something happens. Is that John begins to see a Christ that nobody talks about. John begins to see a Christ that people don't preach much about on Sunday mornings. John sees the risen, glorified, exalted Jesus Christ. And let's look at what he says about it. We have to clip fast, so we've got to move fast through space here. This is the vision. Number one, he sees a righteous Christ. In verse 13, he says, And in the middle of the lamp stands was one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. Uh, th this garment that he's speaking of is the equivalent of the Old Testament garment of the high priest. Uh, he's standing there to represent us to God, to represent his righteousness to God on our behalf. That's why I love 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21 that says, He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why we talk about being clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He goes on to talk about this righteous Christ. He says in verse 14, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. So what does that mean? Well, he's not just talking about the color of his hair. He's talking about the, the glowing white brilliance 
of Jesus' appearance and of his countenance. It's talking about his wisdom and his glory. You know, the Bible says that the gray head is a crown of glory in Proverbs 16, 31. If that's true, there are a lot of glorious people here tonight. That's pretty neat. You know, you know, next time you look in the mirror, you say, you know, you're pretty glorious, you know? And maybe some of you have, you know, the, the, the marble top has is, is appeared and you go, well, you're not so glorious, but you're still pretty cute, you know? <laughs> Just give yourself that compliment. Permission given, right? But no, it's talking about Jesus Christ being this great, glorious Christ. Yes, he is the supernatural sage of the ages, but he's also a righteous Christ. And then in verse 4, it says something about his eyes. It says, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And this refers to Jesus' penetrating gaze into the human heart. You see, Christ is able to have laser-like vision to see way past our actions, uh, way past our thoughts, all the way to our motives. And Paul even said, I don't even know my own motives sometimes. Guess what? Jesus does. Uh, Jesus knows your motives. A couple of years ago, I had the, um, the privilege of writing or helping to write the autobiography of Dr. Raymond Damadian, the man who invented the MRI machine. So if you've ever had an MRI, then you have Dr. Damadian to thank for it. Most brilliant man I've, I've ever met in my entire life. A Christian, uh, and he believed God gave him the idea for, for the MRI. In fact, he was up for the Nobel Prize in science, but they didn't allow him to have it because they discovered he believed in a six-day creation like the Bible talks about. So he was blackballed from that. But in sitting and spending time with Dr. Demetian, I discovered more things about science and the MRI that I never really wanted to know, but I, I learned you know, in writing this book. But here's the thing. The MRI sees more than an x-ray sees. The MRI sees more than a CAT scan sees. The MRI sees all the way down past the bone, the marrow, and the liquids, and everything in the body. Nothing is hidden from the MRI. And that's exactly what, what these eyes of Jesus Christ are like. The Bible says that he sees everything. Uh, these same flaming eyes, by the way, are going to be uh, cast upon the church. They're going to be cast upon the lost at Armageddon as well. These same eyes of this glorified, righteous Christ. It goes on to tell us he's also a refining Christ. It says in verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze when it's been caused to glow in a furnace. And some commentators believe this refers to the, the, the altar there in the tabernacle which was covered in brass that when heated up, it would actually glow. It was a picture of judgment uh, that Christ would be bringing to the world, divine judgment. And he's basically telling the world, this Jesus is about to do some business with the world, first with his own church and then with the rest of the world. He's preparing our hearts for that. And then he goes on to say he's the reproving Christ. I love it. He says, originally, uh, back over in verse 10, Christ's voice was like the sound of a trumpet sort of commanding John's attention. Now it says that his voice was like the sound of many waters. You ever been to the beach, maybe the California beach and those rocky coastlines? You hear the crashing of the waves and the great grandeur and majesty of that just keeps coming over and over again. Certainly John had that in mind when he wrote this. He's there on this Alcatraz Island, as it were. He's hearing the waves crashing perhaps from where he is. But it's a sound of, of great authority of uh, someone who speaks with, with a sense of credibility. And it says here that, that, uh, that he has in his hand the, the seven stars, which are the pastors of the churches. But here's what I love, verse 16. It says, out of his mouth comes a sharp, two-edged sword. So what does that mean? That's the word of God. It's the word of God. And this word that John chooses, that he's seeing this thing happen, Right? And the word that he chooses here is, there are two words for sword uh, in the, uh, the Greek New Testament. Uh, there's the word makaria, uh, which is sort of a dagger-like sword. And this is the word most often used. But there's another word that's used just four times in the New Testament. It's the, it's the Greek word romphaya, romphaya. And this referred to a, uh, really a, a Thracian, uh, this tribe of people had these long swords. Sometimes they were curved on the end, almost like a scimitar, but it's more like a long, broad sword. Think Braveheart sword, okay? It's a sword you would carry into battle. It's a sword you would do close combat with as a soldier. It's a sword that cuts both ways. It's a sword that is intended uh, to have its purpose fulfilled. And this giant sword is the sword that John sees coming out of Jesus' mouth. He's going to see it two other times there 
Now, he's going to see it in chapter 2, verse 16, where Jesus says to the church of Pergamum, if you do not correct your ways, I'm coming to you to make war with you with the sword of my mouth. You don't want to hear that as a church (laughs) or as a believer. But it's also the same sword we see Jesus using in Revelation chapter 19. When he returns at his second coming, he's not there to play. He's there to do business. And he takes that long, broad sword and deals death uh, to his enemies where millions upon millions are judged and slaughtered. It's the word of his mouth. I wonder today how we have lost the respect for that sword that God yields, uh, that he wields. Uh, The sword that he spoke the universe into existence with. That same sword that he, that he gave through Moses. That same sword that you hold in your lap called your Bible. That same word is the word Jesus Christ is using uh, to talk about the book of Revelation. From beginning to end, that's the sword that we see. And then he says in verse 16, uh, he's also the radiating Christ. Uh, he says here in verse 16 that his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? I hope not. Because you can't do it for more than a couple of seconds or it'll burn your corneas. You'll go blind doing that. And John is completely taken back by seeing this brilliance of the absolute, pure, emanating glory of Jesus Christ. My friends, today we talk a lot about the humble carpenter. Uh, We talk a lot about the Christ who died on the cross, who served humanity, who did miracles. And that is completely true and 100% biblical. But we forget that this Christ is now risen. He's glorified and no man can see him and live. And so that's why God gives John this vision. John literally experiences the glory of Christ in this passage. And then look at John's response in verse 17. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. John's response to seeing the risen, glorified, exalted Christ, the cumulative effect of this vision, caused John to fall on his face to say, I can't even look at you. I'm having systems shut down. My central nervous system is completely becoming uh, undone. And I say that seeing this same Christ should wreck us, just like it wrecked Isaiah. When he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, I become ruined. I become ruined. I become undone. I'm coming apart here because I'm seeing deity, exalted deity. This is the trauma of holiness. Uh, This is not the Christ that you read about in books, is it? It's not the Christ that you hear about in most pulpits in America, and it's certainly not the Christ you hear about when someone bumps their head and claims to go to heaven for a week and comes back and writes a best-selling book and makes a movie about it. I don't hear this Christ in those stories. But according to the Word of God, this is the Christ of heaven. He is exalted. He's intimidating. He's transcendent. He's holy other, and he's worthy of our worship. But look what happens next. He's also a reassuring Christ. It says in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, but he laid his right hand, the hand of authority, upon me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. And I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. You see, Jesus Christ is not someone we venerate every Sunday. He's a living Lord. He's risen. He's alive tonight. He's the only one, by the way. All the other religious leaders have rotted and turned to dust in their graves, but Jesus Christ sits exalted at the right hand of the Father. Why is this such a big deal? Well, because Jesus wanted John to know that it's all still true. Hey, you left us 60 years ago. We haven't seen you for 60 years. And Jesus returns to say, I'm still alive. I'm still the eternal one, and I'll live forever, and because I live forever, so will you. And by the way, I love this, what he adds at the end. He says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Satan doesn't rule hell. No. Satan and his minions are not in charge of the afterlife, my friend. They'll be minions in the afterlife, but the Bible tells us in Revelation 14 that that the lamb is over hell. The lamb is the one who is responsible uh, for that place there of his great wrath. 
So Christ is alive, and that's why he says to John. Now, John, verse 19, write. Take a pen and write this. The things which you have seen, that's the past. The things which are, that's going to be the present in chapters 2 and 3. And the things which shall take place after these things. That's essentially the outline of the book. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this the Christ that you know? Or have you been worshiping a false idol? Maybe even a Christ of your own imagination, which is what the world is creating right now. Do you see now how critical the book of Revelation is to the church today? How blatantly and and glaringly Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is revealed in his raw form to the church? You want to know God? Read Revelation. You want to get close to God? Read Revelation. Why? Why? Because Revelation is about Jesus. I love it when pastors sometimes will say to me, I don't do Revelation, I just preach Jesus. You ever heard that, Mark? (laughs) I just preach Jesus, and I go, really? That's very interesting because Revelation is all about Jesus. It's his church he's talking to. It's his revival in the end times. It's his throne, it's his scroll, it's his script, it's his judgments. It's his sovereignty, his 144,000. His two witnesses, Uh, it's his millennial kingdom, his victory over sin, his great white throne judgment. It is his eternity, his new heavens and the earth. It's his glory. It's his revelation. So if you want to know about Jesus, you need to dive headfirst into the book of Revelation. Now, why is that so, so important? Because the key to understanding prophecy in the end times is to know Jesus and what he said here in the book. And that's where we'll close. Give you a couple of take-homes and we're done real quickly. That's the first point. To fully understand the end times, you have to encounter the God of prophecy. You see, here's why that's important. When you and I read Revelation through the eyes of God, we get a perspective, a camera angle that you don't get on this side of eternity. You have to see Revelation through God's eyes. And God didn't hide, but he put into Revelation these attributes that we see coming up through every chapter of Revelation. And through that, we understand more about our God. And that's the key to life, is to knowing God. That's what true revival is, by the way. Uh, Prophecy begins and ends with Jesus Christ. The first prophecy in the Bible is Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. The last prophecy in the Bible is is Revelation 22.10. Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly. That's a prophecy, by the way. So beginning and end, it's all about prophecy. Now, here's the deal. As you and I walk this tightrope of the end times, we wonder, what should I believe? Where should I go? What should I do? That's why we have to stay close to Jesus Christ. And God, as if God is saying through Revelation, no, 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 keep your eyes on me. Watch me. Stop looking around. Remember, Peter, you're going to sink like he did. You look around, you're going to get afraid. You, you look within, you're going to get dismayed. But you look ahead to me, and you're going to be amazed at what I'm going to do in your life. That's why I just like to say that our view of God is the most important thing about us. It determines everything. It fl- everything flows from our view of God. Everything that we do. And then here's the last thing. As we preach this Christ to a dark, depraved, decaying world, we need to know this, is that everything you do for God matters. Because of Revelation 1, everything you do for God matters. Nothing is wasted. He's watching everything. And he's going to reward you for everything that you do for him. And when you get into Revelation, you see it from God's perspective. You start seeing God in Revelation and not just the events of Revelation. Here's what we'll see. We'll see this Jesus is more glorious than we ever imagined. More majestic, more holy, more righteous, more wrathful, more gracious, more loving, more sovereign, more beautiful than we ever thought, believed, or imagined him to be. I love what J. Oswald Chambers says. This is a quote that stuck with me from age 16 when I became a Christian. He says this. He says, when we see him, we will wonder that we ever could have disobeyed him. That is how glorious he is. That is how beautiful he is. That is how worthy he is. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your revelation of yourself in this glorious book of Revelation. And Lord, with this as a foundation of encountering the Christ, we can now move forward 
and understand what is actually going on in the world and why it's happening and why things are going to happen that you prophesy. But God, my prayer tonight is that each of us would begin to encounter this Jesus of Revelation in a fresh way. And may we read this final grand finale that you wrote in a way we never have before. And may we never be the same again. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's give Jeff a hand. Jeff, thanks for coming tonight, opening up the scriptures, giving us insights. Your ministry has impacted us, and we praise God for you. Well, at this time, we're going to have an offering. I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to go ahead and come. If you're writing a check, would you make that out to Mark Henry Ministries? And if you're giving online, whether here or around the world, you can go to markhenryministries.com. Uh, there's a drop-down box. We want you to know it's safe, it's simple, and it's secure. Listen, your prayers and your sacrifices are making all of this possible. Jan and I praise God for you. And we want you to know that you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people at each of these events. So thank you for giving. Thank you for loving Jesus. Thank you for uh, being a radical follower in the midst of this crooked and evil and perverse generation and pointing people to the living God. Father, again, we're just thankful for the chance to be together tonight, to open the scriptures, to reflect on these days, to try and navigate the complexities. And God, thank you for your provision to be able to do this. Thank you for the opportunity. And God, may you allow us this opportunity to unite together in the advancement of the gospel until Jesus comes. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you to join us on our next Israel trip. It's going to be in February of 2025. You can go to markhenryministries.com. There's a drop-down box. Israel there, and you'll get all the information. Now, some of you are going to say, well, that's a long ways off. But, you know, everyone that says that to me waits too long. You got to get signed up. You got to plan ahead. We're going to have a great time in the land of Israel. You know, as we walk around with our Bibles in the land, one of the things that we discover is this, is that Jesus had a message for the past. Jesus has a message for the present, and Jesus has a message for the future. And we're going to see all of that together in the land of Israel. Join us if at all possible. We'd love to have you. Now, in October, October 4th through the 6th, we're going to have another pastor's huddle. And I want to encourage you pastors that are listening right now to plan on coming. We've made a special video. Again, you can find it at Olive Tree Ministries, or you can find it at Mark Henry Ministries. But we've made a special video, a special invitation for you to come. Uh, Dr. Mike Powell will be with us. We're going to be looking at a dispensational interpretation to the uh, book of Revelation, and I think you're going to really be blessed. We've, we've already gotten feedback from the other pastors who have been to the last huddle, and they are, several of them have said to me personally, this huddle has been the single most encouraging thing in my ministry over the last five, ten years, and we think you're really going to be blessed. Uh, if your pastor hasn't come, I want to encourage the rest of you, reach out to your pastor, encourage them, help them to find a financial way. There are some scholarships that are available. Again, you'll find all that ministry at markhenryministries.com. During the huddle, we're going to have another event on the 5th of October, and Barry Stagner is going to be with us. You know him as a pastor, you know him as a teacher, you know him as an author. He's going to be with us. It's going to be a great night. Make sure you get that in your calendar right now, October 5th. Well, let's hear from Barry right now. Now listen, if you add to these things, these stories we just read, the business as usual attitude like it was in Noah's day, they didn't know anything was coming and it wasn't because Noah wasn't preaching because Peter said he's a preacher of righteousness. They had indifference to the impending signs of judgment. Is that going on today? Are we living in perilous times? Is there an unwillingness to endure sound doctrine? All of these things are happening right now and thus we have a rather extensive list of things we can see that tell us the day is approaching. Now, our time today, however, is going to focus on the fact that there are also some things that you can hear before you see them. Anybody hear a helicopter and go looking for it? Where is it? Where's that plane at? Or where is that noise coming from the sky? Or maybe you're familiar with this scene. My car is making a funny noise. You don't know what it is, but you can hear it. You can't see it, right? So we've all said at some point, what's that noise? And we couldn't find out the source of it. And I submit to you today that we are living in a time where not only can we see the day approaching, we can hear it too. And we'll explain that a little more as we go. 
And the day that we can see and hear approaching is the day of the Lord. The day when God finalizes his discipline of the nation of Israel. He fulfills the promised 70th week of Daniel. And when a Christ rejecting world chooses to worship the Antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. And we can see the day approaching through all the things we mentioned a moment ago. But what we cannot and will not see is the title of our time this morning or afternoon, and that is The Sound of the Horseman. The Sound of the Horseman is what I want to talk to you about today, and the evidence that we have that we are starting to hear the hoofbeats of what's going to happen during the ride of the famed Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. At this time, let's welcome the panel. Jan, you have some uh, books there to share with us. We have a table out and back with a number of Olive Tree staff manning it and some products. Um, sorry to say we have sold out of Jeff's book, God's Grand Finale. You can find it in my online store, olivetreeviews.org. Outstanding book on kind of uh, dissecting the book of Revelation. But we do have in stock Jeff's book, As It Was in the Days of Noah, and uh, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. He'll be back there to sign some of those that we have if you'd like to do that. We have so many other products back there. Dave Reagan's War, Nine Wars of the End Times, brand new book. And then something really, really popular right now by Billy Crone, a uh, 12 teaching DVD set, Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, and the coming mark of the beast. So 12, or, uh, yeah, 12 teachings in here might be good for a Bible study or, or for a prayer group of some kind. So all of that plus a lot more on the back table. So go ahead. Fantastic. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you so much. You blessed my heart. You know, as, as you were talking, you, you said something that really stuck out to me, and that is that Jesus Christ is not merely the introduction in the book of Revelation. He is the essence of the book of Revelation. And I've been saying that for 33 years. And, and here's a question for you that, that haunts me. 33 years of pastoring. Jan and I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a month. And people are always like focusing on different events, like the four horsemen. And they just want to keep rehashing and rehashing these things. And I, I'm always pushing them back to Jesus. Why is there this propensity within us to focus on the events rather than Jesus Christ through the book? Why, why do you think that is? That's a great question. I think part of it is the fact that, that we're fascinated by revelation and we're uh, like children. Sometimes we're, we love the shiny objects, you know, and uh, my wife always tells me, she says, you know, we don't have to sensationalize Bible prophecy. It's already sensational enough as it is, but people do sensationalize it. And so there's more of a, an attraction to that. There's a curiosity about that. But Satan, if he could do anything, he would keep us from encountering God one-on-one. -on -one. You can actually study Bible prophecy and never get to know the Lord. Hmm. because you're studying facts. Or you can study Old Testament history, known people that go through whole years of seminary and don't know God. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, when we see who God is in Revelation, which is what Satan wants to keep us from, we encounter him, then the rest of it makes even more sense to us. So I think it's a diversionary tactic Satan uses sometimes. Yeah, he's trying to deceive us uh, to miss the central person, right? Yeah. Because if we see Jesus, as you described there, if we see Jesus, that radically transforms everything. That, I, I was just so blessed. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I think it would radically transform our churches that are running away from it, as you know. I mean, the churches uh, will go through the other books of the Bible, but they get to this one, and my goodness, we, we head the other way. Yeah, as James, you know. It's like going to a movie that has completely just riveted your attention, and you're sitting there for two hours or two hours plus, and then the last 30 minutes of the movie, you just yeah. get up and walk out. Right. Well, who does that, right? But we as Christians claim to love the Word of God. We love Jesus. We love God and everything. But we leave the movie before it's over. And That's God right. wants us to stay all the way to when the credits roll, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You, know, you know, you think about the uh, upper room discourse, and then Jesus goes out and he goes to the garden and he prays. Mm -hmm. And he says, Father, restore unto me the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. And I recently had a pastor uh, say to me, a doctor, you know, a doctorate and so forth. And he says, Mark, I preach Jesus. I don't preach prophecy. I don't preach the book of Revelation. And I said, so you preach the Jesus of the Old Testament, the Jesus of the Gospels, but not the glorified Jesus? Right, right. And that's, I think that's your point. No, it really is. And, and that's the thing is that this glorified Jesus we think is not a marketable Jesus, right? 
And Jesus in the churches today, he needs to be marketable. He needs to be sold to people. This kind of Jesus is not marketable. He's traumatizing. Yeah. He's a threat to ourselves. And really it causes us to lay everything else aside and to worship only him. And that alone is one of the reasons why Satan wants to keep us from it. And so what would you say to pastors right now that are watching? What would you say to them as far as their preaching, the book of Revelation, and uh, preaching this unpopular Jesus, but a, a glorious, victorious Jesus? Yeah. Well, I would just say this, is that if you want your people to really know God, you have to do what Paul said in Acts chapter 20. He says, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. Don't be afraid of revelation. Uh, Don't be afraid of not knowing something. There's plenty of resources, tools, ministries like this that will help you understand the book of Revelation. Many pastors are bivocational. Uh, They don't have the time to do a lot of study. Maybe they didn't go to seminary, weren't formally trained. That's fine. But just dig into the word with all these tools that you have. And what you'll find is you're going to uncover for your own self a treasure trove of truth and help that you can then give away to your people. So don't miss that blessing. And what's this recent book that just came out for the book of Revelation? I want them to hear it one more time. My book? Yeah, your oh, book. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's called God's Grand Finale. God's Grand Finale. Yeah. You can find it at all of Tree Views and uh, go to the bookstore there and you can order that. Amen. Pastors, get that, please. Uh, well, well let's, let's just kind of start with some of the things that are happening uh, currently. And how many of you have heard uh, that there's, there's Martians out there? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, this is everywhere. The question is, um, you know, what does the Bible say about this? And so this, this video is a little long, uh, but I want you to track. And uh, Billy Crone's going to be sharing some thoughts in it. And then I want you two to, to weigh in on it. So let's, let's watch this. Welcome back to In Focus. It's the universal question that's vexed mankind since the dawn of time. Are we alone or is there life beyond our earthly bounds? The topic is front and center on Capitol Hill as lawmakers examine the possibilities of unidentified flying objects, better known as UFOs. A former intelligence officer was among the witnesses appearing Wednesday before the House National Security Subcommittee, making some earth-shattering revelations. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness like how would that be determined the specific documentation i would have to talk to you in a skiff about joining me now with more pastor of sunrise baptist church in las vegas and founder of get a life media ministry pastor billy crone thanks so much for being back with us so soon it's great to see you again yeah you too allison thanks for having me on absolutely so what do you make of former u.s intelligence official david grush's statement at the House hearing, stating that we recovered non-human remains from an alien craft. Yeah, well, actually, uh, if you read the Bible, this shouldn't surprise you, uh, because I think this is all part of a custom-tailored uh, last day's deception to explain away the very event that God says is next on his prophetic time calendar. And that event is called the rapture of the church. And that is when God evacuates all born-again Christians, takes him, them off the planet before the worst time in the history of mankind uh, is thrust upon the planet. The Bible calls that time the seven-year tribulation. So if, in fact, that event is going to happen and you're going to see millions of people disappear uh, and you're an enemy of God, then what would you be doing? You better be coming up with the best excuse you can think of to explain away why all of a sudden these people disappeared and specifically and only specifically Christians. Well, believe it or not, that's exactly what we have with the alien deception. Uh, They're called aliens. I agree with that guy. They're non-humans, but I don't agree with their assessment that they are a higher evolved race of beings uh, from the other side of the solar system or galaxy or whatever here to help us. It's a deception. They call them aliens. The Bible calls them demons. And they are right now being used to become the perfect excuse to explain away, hey, what happened to those people when all of a sudden they disappeared off the planet? And and again, what should you expect if we're getting close to that event that Bible calls the rapture? Then you should see exactly what we're seeing in the news right now. 
And that is for decades, we've known that the government and the governments around the world have completely denied any existence of aliens, alien crafts, whatever. A few years ago, you noticed that they immediately switched gears and they started to say, well, yeah, I guess there are some craft uh, that we see out there that seem to be alien, uh, not of uh, indigenous to planet Earth. Now what you're seeing is the next step that you can expect, and they are now saying not only crafts, but these beings, these non-human beings are in these crafts, and, and they're starting to admit that now. And the reason why is because it's called soft disclosure, uh, predictive programming. If you're going to use the alien UFO thing to explain away the rapture of the church, then you have to slowly work people up into that. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. So I'm not surprised by it because I'm convinced it's the excuse to explain away what happened to those people that disappeared. Wow. OK, now, now you two, I think there's a couple things we got to talk about. First is how many verses in the Bible talk about aliens? I think we do need to answer that question because Christians should always start with the Bible first, right? Yeah. And so right. would you please answer that? For that us? That's an easy one because it's right there in the book of second condominiums. <laughs> we could just open and turn to it uh, right now. Yeah, uh, I somehow missed that book yeah, in my it was, Bible. It's, it's right near Hezekiah and Hesitations, those two oh. books. That's right near those two books. Uh, no, I mean, as you, as you search the scriptures, you, you don't find any Bible verses that talk about aliens and beings from another planet, uh, that type of thing. Uh, in fact, uh, part of the preponderance of belief in aliens really goes to help support the theory of evolution. The idea that we're not the only beings that are, a race that has evolved right. in the universe, that there are other races that had the same protos plasmic, you know, whatever, primordial ooze, you know, that brought us into the world. So it's that. So I don't really see a verse there. Uh, the, to me, the, um, the fact that there, there are things that we cannot explain in the world, uh, I don't think that we necessarily have to be able to explain everything. But at the same time, apart from God saying something in his word, I cannot authoritatively stand on the word of God and say, that is this or that. Now, can Satan imitate real things. So certainly Satan is a deceptive creature. He's the father of lies, as we talked about earlier. Uh, he has powers we don't know of. And certainly, as you pointed out in the last days, uh, Mark, he's going to be able to do greater and greater things. Now, can Satan make a spacecraft? I don't know. Uh, but I'll just say this. I'm not sure that I even trust some of the government reports, Jan, that are, that are coming out there. So I, I'm going to step back and just say if the Bible didn't talk about it, but I will say this, is that Satan is very deceptive and he certainly will use it in the end times. Well, we read about end time delusion, end time deception, which right. is, get, grows exponentially the f later we get. And I, I find it interesting that the UFO phenomenon uh, began in, well, it goes back 100 years, but picked up steam uh, around 1947, 1948. So did the demonic world understand that something incredibly miraculous happened in uh, 48 with mm. the rebirth of Israel? And that's when these things took off. You know, no pun intended, but, but that's when they grew exponentially in, after 1948. And, as, and I picked that clip out because Billy Crone summed it up so appropriately in four minutes that the closer the demonic world apparently believes we're getting to the rapture, the more this is intensifying. And by the way, somebody just sent me this today, literally today, aliens didn't take me, Jesus did. <laughs> so, first one up here who wants it at the end can get it. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised you didn't wear that out here tonight. That's uh, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Everybody who thinks Jan should wear that on her next show. Yeah. Okay. There we go, Jan. All right. The, the yeas have it, Mark. Yeah, so, I think so. You know, on, on that topic, too, I mean, you think about, you know, what, Mark, what uh, Billy said about the, um, the explanations that people will give immediately after the post-rapture. And obviously, there are going to be dozens of exp explanations. Uh, politicians, pundits, philosophers, false prophets, they're all going to weigh in on what just happened to these hundreds of millions of people. I do think alien abductions may be one of those explanations, for sure. There'll be certainly others that people will give. What's very interesting... In the first set of sealed judgments, right at the end of that, which is very early on in the tribulation period, by the time you get to the end of the sealed judgments, everybody on planet Earth knows 
that they're coming from God. The judgments are coming from the Lamb and from Him who sits on the throne. There are no atheists in the tribulation. Do you know that? Not a single atheist exists. They all know God exists. They know He's sending the judgments. So for me, I think they're going to pretty much put two and two together and go, it was the rapture. And, uh, and after that, there's going to be a sense of, that deception is going to lead to a sense of depravity. And as you go through the rest of Revelation, it says they begin to, to continue to do their sin, refuse to repent of their sins. Revelation 9, by the time you get to Revelation 16, they're now blaspheming God. So humanity just gets worse and worse and worse. So it begins yeah. with curiosity, what just happened, oh, this is what happened, to, oh, wait, it's God who's doing these things, to we don't like God, we hate God. Yeah. That's why we're killing these baby Christians in the tribulation period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's in the sixth seal that yeah. you just referenced. But in, in, in the fifth seal, it, it, there's the scene in heaven where everyone's been martyred. So this, right. this, this, this focal point of those who are turning to the living God and believing in Christ during the days of tribulation, their, their, their contempt for God, their contempt for them just heating yeah. up. And, and Mark, so. that tells me that some of those early people, their explanation is going to be, that was the rapture. Yeah. I know immediately yeah. that was the rapture. And millions are going to come to Christ from every tribe and tongue and nation. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, to all of you who are fascinated by the UFOs, I would just say this. Please focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, there's going to be a lot of people running around in prophecy circles and so forth writing books on UFOs. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you a secret. Focus on Jesus, not UFOs. Mm-hmm. Because if you focus on the UFOs rather than Jesus then you're buying in, you're wasting mental, emotional, spiritual energy on something that doesn't have any spiritual value. Is that that safe to say? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay. So there's UFOs. How about about this, though? Apostasy. (laughs) Now, you think about apostasy, it means, you know, to to, uh, abandon something, to turn away from something, to defect. And in 2 Thessalonians, it talks about this great apostasy in the last days. And I... You know, as, as, as I read that in the past, it never really uh, gripped me as to how those who had uh, served Christ and then their children, you know, worshiping in those same buildings and so forth, would embrace such a deception about God, morality, the Bible. And I'm blown away by what's happening today. I want you to respond to this. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus, this next two minutes is going to be very unsettling. But Jan and I decided to show it to you because this is the reality of the apostasy of the last days. Watch this. Rejoice, O people of God, rejoice. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's creativity is boundless. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. The tender mercy of God is renewing the earth. The the tenacious justice of God is healing all wounds. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. We join our hearts to worship our Creator in whom our joy is complete. Alleluia. Amen. Beloved, in the face of oppression, we proclaim the justice of God. In the face of meanness and hate, we claim the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. May the peace of Christ be with you. Now please share it to one another. 
Friends, friends, that was blasphemy. That was blasphemy. I want you two to respond because what we just witnessed is a older church building that was probably yes. built by genuine followers of the yes, Lord Jesus I Christ. The same thing. And Jesus was once proclaimed and honored in that place. Now, they used Jesus' name. They referenced phrases that we recognize right. as we read through the Psalms and so forth. But was Jesus, was God honored hmm. with what we just saw? No, no, you're right. It's, it's blasphemy. The thought that immediately comes to mind is the Antichrist in the midpoint of the tribulation will enter the Holy of Holies and a rebuilt Jewish temple and commit what Jesus and Daniel call the abomination of desolation. Uh, it's his ultimate way of putting his foot on the neck of belief in God. This is the trial run for that. Uh, desecrating former houses uh, of God. Uh, you know, Mark Hitchcock and I wrote a book called The Coming Apostasy where yeah. we identified that apostasy, apostasy comes in forms of doctrine and of uh, behavior. So bad beliefs lead to bad behavior. Uh, when we depart from the biblical doctrines we found in the scriptures, and that's why Paul said to Timothy over and over again, teach sound doctrine. Don't depart from sound doctrine because the minute you depart from that, you're, you're going off into apostasy. And this is what we're seeing. This is just in one area. I read this, actually saw this article this week, the number one Christian album on iTunes, Christian in the Christian album charts, is by a transvestite called, uh, called Flamey Grant. Hmm. Uh, because so many of Amy Grant's followers are, are gay people. So Flamey Grant, and he has this, this album that he has, the number one album on Christ, in the Christian charts. The number two album on the Christian charts is by a Christian artist who name you would know, who said publicly, I don't know if homosexuality is a sin because, quote, I'm not God. Those are the top two spots mm -hmm. in the Christian community. So has apostasy infiltrated the church? Yes. But here's what we need to remember. I, I think about, and I don't want to take too much time on this myself, but I'm just saying, Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Satan is building fortresses. He's territorial. His demons are. We are destroying speculations in every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The way to destroy Satan's fortresses is not with hate or with violence. It's with the word of God. Because only the word of God is powerful, changing individual lives. So this apostasy is alarming, Jan. Yeah. It's, it's creeping into just about every denomination. Oh, absolutely. And some high-profile pastors are following it. Yes. Looking at these young people or whatever, uh, they, they are so deceived. They believe they're Christians. Mm. Imagine the shock, if they don't get saved, imagine the shock. They're in the pulpit, raising their hands, praising the Lord as pagans, when they're ushered into hell. Will somebody get to them, please, and give them the true gospel before it's too late? Amen. Please. Amen. You know what? As I saw that, I was reminded in the book of Exodus. Moses goes up on the mountain to meet with God. They say, give us a God to Aaron. And Aaron makes the golden calf and he sets it up. And he says, hero Israel is the God who led you out. So he, he gave credit to the right God. Remember, they just mentioned the Christ. They mentioned God in there. Okay. And so he says, worship this, this golden calf. And you remember the, the, the pagan, godless immorality that was happening around it. And God says to Moses, go down there and deal with those folks. <laughs> Friends, God was not well pleased. And God is not well pleased with this. And it is total deception to believe that this is acceptable to God. It's not acceptable to God. Now, now, Jeff, you've been a pastor. You're a trained theologian. Uh, you've served the Lord for 40 years now. And, and I want you to speak to the pastors who are in this room and the pastors who are listening. There's a, there's a famous statement that pastors need to have at least two voices, mm -hmm. one to gather sheep and one to confront yeah. the wolves. Yeah. Because yeah. you and I need to hear this, friends, because pastors are going to have to do both, at least these two voices. Yeah. What would you say to pastors right now? You know, I cannot say it better than the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to say it in some of his last words, where he said to 
Timothy said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. So to be a pastor is a very sobering thing. Uh, it, it's holy ground that you tread upon. He says, by his appearing and his kingdom, he says, preach the word. Karuksan tan logan. And that word preach means to herald unashamedly, boldly, without hesitation. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove, exhort with great patience and instruction. Why? Because he says, for the time will come, and you just saw it, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. That's our way of saying it makes us feel good. It gives us a sense of self-empowerment. It's a self-help sermon. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away, that's the apostasy, their ears from the truth, because there's only one truth, and will turn aside to myths, things that are not true. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Listen, we're all in a race. We're in the race of life. We're in the race of the mission that God has given us, pastor or not pastor. We all want to finish strong. And we want to finish like Paul said in the rest of these verses, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, and there is laid up for me a reward at the end of this thing. And that's what pastors need to know. And if you have a pastor that's doing it, amen, yeah. amen. And if you have a pastor that's standing up in these last days, yes. like John the Baptist did, like the apostles did, you need to encourage him because Supporting. I promise you, Satan's working overtime to discourage yeah. him. Yeah. Now, I, well, let's move to another, another topic. Um, you know, Satan is always telling us the opposite of what God <laughs> says to do. And, and God, whenever he talks about population in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always that children are a blessing from the Lord and, and uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And yet we are constantly bombarded that, that people are the problem and that we're destroying the planet and so forth. And, and so you've got to ask the question, who's right and who's wrong? It's just interesting. If God says one thing, it's not surprising Satan says something different. We want you to hear from the vice president. We want you to see how this has infiltrated every area of life in our society. So, so just, just, just watch this. And so we set an ambitious goal to cut our greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030 and to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The investment we are announcing today will help us to achieve these goals and it will do so much more. Because think also about the impact on not only the local economy, not only on an investment in the entrepreneurs and innovators from and in the community, think about the impact on something like public health. When we invest in clean energy and electric vehicles and reduce population and reduce population and reduce population, more of our children can breathe clean air and drink clean water. <laughs> 17 UN Global Goals for 2030. And key to that is a reduction of the population of the world. How do you, how would, how do you, if, if the vice president was here, what would you say to her? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> A lot. I would say I can think of one way to reduce emissions. <laughs> Stop emitting lies. That would be one way. Um, you know, this all goes back, I think, to Romans chapter one, where Paul yes. outlines in beautiful form how when we reject the clear evidence of yeah. the creator in creation, we're left to ourselves. And when we're left to ourselves, we, he says, begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. And this is all couched, this whole 17 point plan, how many ever there are, all couched around the planet. Everything is about serving the planet, reducing emissions, reducing population. Everything is about serving planet, mother earth, as they call it. And so this is really just the, the natural cause and effect. And it's really, it's a part of God's wrath because part of God's wrath is abandoning people to themselves. And this is a part of God's abandonment that we would leave God's order of creation 
and start serving the creation and reduce population. That's, that's code for more abortions, by the way. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's euthanasia. It's all these nutty globalists. I mean, this is a part of their agenda is reduce the population. The thing is, they're not going to reduce the population of the elite. They're going to right. reduce the population of people who are expendable, and that's you and me. Yeah. And they're going to do it in not very humane ways. I mean, just look at what the, the abortion, uh, you know, you name it. It's, it's a very godless children. agenda. Yeah. Godless okay. agenda. God, yeah. God is pro-life. God is pro-everyone having an abundant, fruitful life. These people, and a po certain political party, is pro-death. Well, much more could be said, you know, in the last days it talks about how the Antichrist would control the food. And so some folks were over in uh, Europe and they went to the grocery store to get some food and they found it very difficult to get some food. Let's, let's watch this. So look at this. You're in London. You're on a business trip. You're staying in Greenwich and want to buy some food. So you go into the local oldies, like this one, and you think, I'm going to go in here and buy some food so that I can feed myself. And then you approach the barrier, and look, you can't even get in the shop without having a QR code to scan here, or to scan here, and then you can go in and buy things. Now this looks to me like the beginning stages of the digital prison that we keep talking about. What do you think? Digital pri prison. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow radio starts for this coming weekend. Michelle Bachman and I talk for an hour about this, this digital prison. She's the one who actually found this clip for mm -hmm. us. So, I mean, this is, again, this is what the globalists have in store for, for the world. Are we here for this? I, it's hard to say. Mark, you think we're here for this? Mm. You I know, mean, it's, it's kind of here already, so we're here. Yeah, it's already, it's already upon us. How, how many of you have gone and tried to pay for something, and they had you jump through all these digital requirements, and you couldn't figure out how to pay? I mean, have you had that experience? I had lunch today, and, and they're saying, well, you got to do this and this and this and this, you know, with this little box there on the, on the table. And then finally, she couldn't make it work either. And she goes, well, let me just go take care of it. And I was like, why didn't we start with that to begin with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything is becoming more and more complex, difficult, and Satan laughs. Here, here's another one. Uh, we've all heard about the, the, the chip. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've, we've speculated a little bit about how the Antichrist might use this, whether it's the, the barcodes or... Uh, or, or a chip. And the question is, what would motivate people? I mean, I, you know, you read Revelation 13 and he controls the food. What's going to motivate people to get the, uh, the mark of the beast? And this, this could be part of that, yeah. right? And the carrot and the stick, it's always got to come down to the carrot or the stick. Yeah. And so in, um, um, in a podcast this last week, they were talking about that. And this, this is a little bit of speculation, but the carrot stick concept comes out. Listen to this. Here's a question. Would you let someone implant a microchip into your hand if you would receive $2,000 a month, a month in return for getting a chip put in your hand? You heard me right. We'll give you universal basic income, basically, 2,000 euros, $2,000 a month if you allow us to put a microchip in your hand. That's exactly what's about to happen as part of the rollout of the central bank digital currencies. That's a carrot for them to rope you into this mess. Now, I wasn't able to confirm that, and, and they had some intel that I, that I was un, unable to obtain. But how do, what grabs you two as you listen to that? I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, man, if somebody offered my neighbors, my friends, $2,000 if you were chipped, and then he said to his wife, $2,000 if you're chipped, and this will, this will come every month. Well, that's your house payment, and that's two new cars. Yeah, the money. temptation to go down this, this, this trail is going to be is going to be powerful. Absolutely. I mean, think about how little people on the planet have any sort of moral infrastructure to guard them from these things. 
Most people are lemmings. Most people are yes. sheep. We've seen this in the past couple of years. They will do whatever is asked of them is, like you said, the carrot and the stick, which is really a bait and a, and a hook, uh, is asked of them or, or whatever is, is given to them in exchange for that. So this is a, a grooming mechanism for what eventually will be, I believe, the mark of the beast. I don't believe the chip is the mark of the beast, but it certainly is an intrusion towards that, that end. And so this is Satan. He's, once again, he's grooming the planet uh, for his man of sin because keep this in mind. Satan's end goal is to be worshipped by humanity. And he's going to get there not by showing how wonderful he is, but by, by being able to control people and saying, well, you're not going to eat. You're not going to have a job. You're not going to pay your mortgage, anything, unless you do this for me. And so it's, it's a bait and switch type of thing. Um, I think that the, what we're seeing as believers, the, the infrastructure of the Antichrist is being established in our lifetime. How many of you are shocked by what you're seeing on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Stunning, this infrastructure being built. Uh, everywhere we look, we've seen it tonight, four or five, in the next clip we're gonna show, again, we're gonna see the infrastructure being established as we speak. And uh, my goodness, you realize how late the hour is? Mm -hmm. I think that's the point of this. How late the hour is. If you haven't trusted in Christ, today's the day of salvation. That's right. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when I saw that clip, I was like, what government would give $4,000 to us as a couple every single month to be chipped? And then I started thinking, our, our current, many of our current politicians believe printing money is not a problem to accomplish any objective that they have, right? Wow. Well, AI Jesus. Okay. Now, now we're going we're gonna to show you a little clip. And I want, I want you to start with, think about what Jeff shared with us tonight about the glorified Christ, the glorified Christ who's in heaven, who's coming in glory, power, and majesty, and see if this reflects, or is this a distortion of the glorified Christ that we read about in Revelation 1. Let's watch this. Jesus, who is the real Jesus? The Jesus in Christianity or Islam, supertopia. It's important to understand that Jesus is viewed differently in Christianity and Islam. In Christianity, Jesus is recognized as the Son of God and the central figure of the faith. In Islam, Jesus, known as Isa, is considered a prophet and the Messiah, but not divine. Both religions acknowledge Jesus as an essential figure, but their understanding of him differs. This highlights the diversity of beliefs across different faiths. It is up to an individual's personal faith and understanding to determine which interpretation they most closely identify with. The important thing is to learn, understand, and respect the perspectives of others, and continue having meaningful and respectful conversations about faith, religion, and spirituality. Well, the first thing I thought of was he's, he's trying to do some sort of Jedi mind trick with this... <laughs> This hand thing, what, what was that all about? Uh, you know, as we move towards, more towards the end times, Satan wants to invent a customizable Jesus, mm -hmm. essentially, where Jesus can be whatever you want him to be. And that, again, is part of the essence of apostasy. And as we go toward the end times, there are going to be more and more voices coming out saying these kinds of things. Here's the thing. There's only one group of people on the planet who know the real Jesus, and it's his betrothed bride and those ones who know the word of God. And that is why your mouth, your influence, your ability is more critical now than at any time in church history because Jesus is being transformed, redefined, reinvented. He's a, he's a Barbie is basically what he is. You can dress him up any way you want to. And so it, it, it behooves us to speak out about who the real Christ is. So Mark, this is artificial intelligence, what we saw. I think this kind of technology could be involved in, in the, we've, this is supposedly the image of Jesus, the image of the beast is going to be some form of artificial intelligence. And I, I believe there's going to be an image of the Antichrist in cities all over the world. You mm -hmm. want to worship the beast? You come and worship something like this. Right. So that's, that's how, art, I mean, artificial intelligence is the most stunning thing ever to be invented, mm -hmm. I think. But this is... This is how, um, how dangerous it is and, and how 
it can be used for utter evil. Yeah, millions right now are turning on AI Jesus. This is what we just saw up there is running uh, 24 hours a day. People just log on from around the world and they ask various questions. Some are pertinent questions, some are not. But, but it's always a distortion of the truth. Um, and then, of course, you can set up your own AI Jesus now. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have the public AI Jesus, but with the algorithms that they know about you, you can go in and you can set up your own. And we did this in the office this week, and we're asking uh, one of the staff members their personal AI Jesus questions, and all of them distorted the truth. Friends, if you want to hear from Jesus, open the book of books. The record is there. The truth is there. Follow the Jesus of the Bible, not the AI Jesus. Remember what Jesus said. Amen. Do not be misled. And he said there will be many Christs in the last days. And as I, as I was thinking about that this week, could this be a portion of what he was describing? Obviously, it's going to be like real people that come along and say, I'm the Christ. Mm -hmm. And he's here or there. He's, Jesus warns, don't go out to them. Um, if you're, if you're you know, in your 20s and 30s, I just want to say to you, or if you're, if you're in teens, do not turn to the AI Jesus for truth. Mm -hmm. Turn to the living Christ. He's given us a book. You can trust him. These words are true. Amen. Okay. Jan, you've got some questions for us. Okay. Um, maybe just to, to open with a practical one. And great questions here. I wish we could get to all. We may not. But um, either one of you... Are the Old Testament saints going to be raptured with us? No, the, the Old Testament saints will not be raptured with us. Uh, the church, the bride of Christ, is the only group of people that will be raptured. Uh, he's going to come back for us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 13 through 18. So it will just be the bride of Christ that will be raptured at that time. The Old Testament saints are resurrected yeah. at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Right. Uh, but Acts chapter 2, what, so what... What makes up the body of Christ act from the, those believing from Acts chapter 2 all the way up until the rapture. They're going to be resurrected or raptured, taken up to heaven. Um, and then the tribulation unfolds. And you remember when Jesus comes back, Revelation 19. Revelation 20 sets up his millennial kingdom. And the, and the martyred saints will be resurrected then. Abraham will be resurrected. Isaac, all of them at that time. Yeah. Uh, do you think the UFO and alien phenomenon will be the great deception after the rapture? Yes. And that was one of the purposes that we started with that very topic and that very clip. Do you want to add to that at all, gentlemen? I think it could be, it will be an initial deception. I think it'll fade pretty fast uh, because things are going to start happening on the earth uh, and people are going to realize again, as I said before, that God's in charge of this. The rapture is what happened. But here's the thing. Most of those people don't even care that it was the rapture because their hearts are so hardened yeah. and they're beginning to fall under Satan's delusion during the tribulation. Yeah, and they're willing and ready to blaspheme. As you go through those who dwell upon the earth, that's a repeated yeah. phrase, yeah. through the book of Revelation of the unsaved people, and they're, they're sticking their fist up at God, blaspheming, blaspheming all the way through, mm -hmm. and it just intensifies all the way towards the end. And if you think about it, even during the millennial kingdom, because there's going to be people born during the millennial mm -hmm. kingdom uh, with natural bodies just like you and I have, and they're going to see Jesus on CNN and Fox News throughout the millennial kingdom for the thousand years. And then Satan's released. And they're very willing and ready, even though they've been with Jesus and seen a just government and, yeah. you know, the perfect leader and the king of kings and all of that. And all of his glory and all of his majesty. And they're going to see saints with resurrected bodies and all kinds of things that are amazing that no generation has ever seen. They're still willing to rebel against him because the depravity of man is so great. Did you say we have CNN, CNN during the millennium? <laughs> really? Seriously? <laughs> it'll be a sanctified. I was going to say, it's been yeah, it'll be yeah. yeah. I mean, we've still, still got the earth here, right? We've still got the earth. I'm going to stay out of the millennium then. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a redeemed. It's a redeemed. Redeemed yeah. CNN. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, it seems every generation, good, it's true, every generation thinks the Lord's return is near. What sets our generation apart or makes it different? I'll just say one word, and that's two, three words, rebirth of Israel. But, but go ahead, gentlemen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the imminent return of Christ has been on the church's heart since the first century. 
All throughout the New Testament, there's so many phrases that are repeated about the eagerly anticipating the soon return of Christ. So they believed he could return in any moment. Paul believed that. Uh, but we have seen God's prophetic clock begin to start ticking again with the rebirth of Israel. And something that no generation before us has ever seen is the fact that these, these rivers of, of prophecy that we see in Daniel and Revelation are converging before our very eyes. Now, the thing we don't know is how fast the rivers are going. You know, we don't know when they're going to come together and when the rapture is going to happen, but we're seeing things that previous generations never saw before. And, you know, many people will, will downgrade the reality of Israel becoming a nation. Friends, I, I, just, I just want to encourage you. For 2,000 years, basically, mm -hmm. the people had been dispersed. The Jewish people had been dispersed from the land. But God had said they would, become, they would come back to the land and that they would be a nation again. They'd be reconstituted. And you think about even uh, the war in Ukraine right now, Ukraine has the second largest population of Jewish people, and this war is driving the Jewish people back to the land. And, and, and there's no other ancient people that, that go back to their land. This is an amazing, it's unprecedented in history. Uh, I have people all the time say, you know, this, is, this, this really doesn't mean anything. I'm like, really? And a lot of you talk about the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. Well, just so you know, in the sovereignty and providence of God, he promised they would come back and they're back. Right. And then with that, these rivers, like you're talking mm -hmm. about, and the confluence of any great river depends upon all those feeder streams happening, yeah, right. such as the apostasy, such as this, such of these things we've talked about tonight. This is unprecedented. Now, one other thought, and that is simply this. If anybody says to you, well, the church has always believed that Jesus was coming back, why is it any different? Friends, you want to be in that group of people that are eagerly anticipating Jesus' coming. Otherwise, you are not doing what it says to do in the scriptures. They we're supposed to look forward to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're not, you're spiritually being sapped in the process. Right. But because they did it in the past doesn't mean it wasn't true. The imminent return, any second Jesus can come back, nothing had to happen. Israel didn't have to be back in the land. Jesus could have come first. But in the providence of God, the nation of Israel is there. These, the confluence of things that are happening Jesus is coming. Be ready. If you haven't trusted in Christ, I beg you, I plead with you. Today is the day. Trust in him. Amen. Yeah. Why don't we wrap it up with this? And um, I'm going to expand it just a little bit. The question is, how can a single mother prepare for the financial crash ahead? What should I do to be ready? How can anyone prepare for the financial cr trouble, crisis, crash, maybe appropriate ahead? <clears throat> what should I do to be ready? Obviously, first we need to be spiritually ready, but, and Mark, this is kind of your specialty as far as kind of how things are going to unfold and what we do to protect ourselves, but I think both of you should address this. I would say this, that, you know, Martin Luther said this, he said, if I knew Christ was coming back tomorrow, I would plant a tree today with the idea that I may be around here to see that tree grow. You know, we don't know, even though we're seeing the velocity of these converging signs, we still don't know when they're actually going to converge. So though we anticipate the Lord's return at any time, we also have to get up every day and live our lives. We have to raise our children, we have to change diapers, we have to mow the lawn, got to go to work, do the dailies, do what you would do if Christ wasn't coming back for 10 years. Continue to do what you're supposed to do, but have within your heart to know that today could be the day. I heard someone say recently, they're only uh, there are only two days on a Christian's calendar. There's this day and there's that day. And we look forward to that day, but we live in this day. So make sure that whatever you do, that you make sure you live for Christ in the moment. Yeah, Jan, I, I would say to you moms out there and to you dads out there, um, there are difficult times coming upon America and I mean, if Jesus doesn't come, I'm just telling you, globally, right now, the things that are being put into play, it's going to be very painful. But if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So you just remember this. You and I are aliens and strangers here, and we're going to heaven. That's where your mansion is. Amen. That's where the safety and security is. And though they may kill the body and though we may die, listen, friends, this is so important. We love our children. I love my grandsons. I never want them to experience difficulty and hardship. But in the providence of God, if he allows us to endure the difficulties, 
then he will give us the grace for that hour. Now, this is really important. You don't have the grace for that hour. When the saints were persecuted all through biblical history, and you read their accounts, and you say, I just don't know if I can do that. You're right, you can't, because you're not facing that moment. That's right. Daily grace, the grace that's necessary for that temptation, that hardship, that affliction, will come in that hour. So number one, be mindful of that. You don't have the grace at the moment, but you will. Number two, exercise wisdom. Go back to the book of Proverbs. Moms and dads, live frugally. Mm -hmm. Don't don't listen to the world. Don't live like the world. You live with the wisdom of God. God's given you the wisdom, and he's given, it says, wisdom for every generation is found in this book. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, you remember this, that as God provided for the sparrows, Mm God will provide for you. I don't know how all of that will work out. I can tell you as a, as a missionary, Jerry and I left the, the business world. Our family had a business. Jerry and I, as we got married in our later teen years, we had it made. And we left that to follow Jesus. And, and it meant uh, financial poverty for us, okay? We lived on deer meat and potatoes, and that's not a, that's not a made up reality. I mean, that's, that's reality. And I don't even know how God took care of us, but as God took care of us and as God took care of our children, God's going to take care of you. Jesus said, do not be anxious. Six times in Matthew 6, do not be anxious. And he was talking to people who were oppressed by the Roman government. He's talking to people who had been pillaged by the Roman government. He says, let not your heart be anxious. Don't worry. Six times through that text. And he says, as God feeds the birds, he'll feed you. If you're scared, go out and look at the birds tonight. Go out and look at the birds tomorrow and say, God, you fed them. And we're more valuable than the birds. So God, you feed my children. I've done that. And God has shown up. You remember what he goes on and says, um, don't worry. He says, um, Solomon had great clothes, Mm -hmm. um, but aren't the lilies of the field greater than all of Solomon's clothes? Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't know how God's going to work it out, but you walk wisely, you walk humbly before God, and God will show himself strong because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Turn to someone and say, you can do all things through Christ. Tell them. You online, listen, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And go read that in Philippians 4. And you know what that text is? The context of that verse is how to get along with much and how to get along with little. You can do all things through Christ. Well, give these two a hand, would you? We love you too so much. Thank you for investing your time and your lives uh, serving Christ and, um, and, and feeding us and encouraging us and exhorting us in the Lord. And we want you guys to know uh, we really, really do love you. Give them a hand one more time for me. Well, you know, one of the things that impacts me every time we have one of these or Jan and I are on the radio together or um, I, I'm traveling... And I see these events unfolding, and I see lawlessness increasing, and, and the blasphemy increasing all around us. Um, this last week, I was so overwhelmed. I, I literally was just overwhelmed. And so I went to a quiet place, and I said, Lord, I can't take this anymore. And I said, what about the children? What about our grandchildren? What about my friends and their kids? And and our church family that we love so much, and all of you online, we love all of you. Listen, we pray for you. You're our family. And I was just reminded, Jesus reminded me, the Spirit of God reminded me of Genesis 6. Noah and his family living in wicked days. There was no church for them to go to. There was no fellowship. There was no online ministry. There was no great publishing house printing off books like We see from Jeff and Jan and able to read those things. Friends, they didn't even have the Bible that you have. And what are those famous words there that in the midst of all that wickedness that God saw, that the thought of men's heart were only evil continuously? I mean, doesn't that almost describe our day exactly? And then God says, I'm I'm fed up, 120 years. And then we get to that amazing verse, verse 8, and it says, Noah found grace In the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And and, and friends, the bottom line is this. The world 
is filled with wickedness. It's rebelling against God. The question is this. Have you found grace in the eyes of the Lord? I mean, it says Noah found grace in the eyes. He found God's favor. He couldn't earn it. He couldn't pay God back. But he experienced God's grace. And he experiencing God's grace, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, it resulted, it overflowed to his family. It overflowed to his children. And for 120 years, as a lone family, as an outpost of righteousness, preaching righteousness, they build the ark. And people are mocking them. You guys are a bunch of nuts. You're crazy. And though they tried to thwart the plan of God, the ark is completed after 120 years. And then those eight people, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I asked my grandson, what does it mean that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? He found God's favor, but then how did it overflow? My grandson was thinking. I said, how about this? Did it overflow to his wife? Oh, yeah, Papa. Did it overflow to his sons? Oh, yeah, Papa. Oh, what about his, his daughter-in-laws? Oh, yeah, it flowed over them. What about the animals that were on the ark? It overflowed to them. Listen, grace is what was needed for that hour. And grace is what's needed for this hour. Friends, there's common grace. There was common grace that was given to that generation. For 120 years, God was patient. For 2,000 years, God has given out common grace. And throughout the scriptures, there's this, this constant reminder over these last 2,000 years, seek the Lord while he may be found. Do you know what it says in Titus? That the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Grace has appeared. Jesus Christ has appeared. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. Friends, you and I don't have to go through the tribulations. We don't have to, we don't have to experience God's wrath in hell. We don't have to experience God's wrath here upon the earth. Instead, we can experience his grace. And my question to you is this. Will it be said of you, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jan found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Sally found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jeff found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Brian found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Sally found... Is your name going to be written like that? It can be, and it can be tonight. You see, when you and I recognize our sin and that Jesus is the grace of God that has come so that we might have everlasting life and that he died as a substitute for our sins on that cross, if you will just simply put your trust in him, the grace of God will flood upon you, taking our sins away and transforming us from the children of wrath to the children of the living God. It'll be said of you in these last days that God's grace was upon you. What's keeping you from trusting Christ right now? I mean, think about it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Tonight you can come to the Father. Those of you online, you can come to the Father. You might be watching a month from now. Listen, you can come to the Father right now. You can experience the grace of God. Let it be said of you that grace came upon you. It's an amazing verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Religiosity won't get there, get, get you there. Um, good works on your part won't get you there. Helping little old ladies across the street. How many of you are little old ladies that need help? <laughs> right? I mean, that's not going to get you to heaven. But friends, Jesus can get you to heaven. And if you trust him tonight, you can have everlasting life. You can experience the grace of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The question is, Will you experience God's grace? Why don't you trust him now? What does it mean to believe? It means to know some facts, that you're sinful, and that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he died on the cross. It's to give mental assent to that. Say, yes, there's a real Jesus, there's a real cross, there's a real resurrection. That's what the Bible describes. He's really resurrected, he really is the Son of God, he really is coming in glory, power, and majesty. And then there's that moment, let it be now, where you say, God, the best I know how, I trust Jesus and him alone to pay for my sins and have everlasting life. Will you do that right now? I'm going to pray. Why don't, you, why don't you just 
pray with me. Why don't you just join me tonight? Would you do that? Those of you online, would you join me tonight? Father, we are so thankful that Jesus has come, that we might experience your grace in this age, in this generation. And just as the ark was the only way of salvation in Noah's day, even so Jesus is the only ark, the only way of salvation. God, I pray for each of my friends that each of them would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Maybe you feel the Spirit of God stirring your heart right now. Let me ask you a question. Do you know that you're sinful and that your sins separate you from God? Do you know that Jesus is the Son of God? He died on the cross to pay for sins. Do you know that God has declared him to be the Son of God by resurrection? And if you say yes to that, then let me ask you this. Will you right now trust in him? The best you know how. Jesus, and you can articulate it with these words if you'd like in your heart. Jesus, the best I know how, I trust in you. You died for sins. I trust that you died for my sins. The best I know how, I trust in you as the living Christ, the Redeemer, my Redeemer, my hope, and my salvation. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for giving me everlasting life. God, thank you for hearing our prayers and letting grace rest upon us in this generation. God, we love you for that, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, friends, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Lord bless y'all.